Without further ado, please let me welcome Professor Hume. Okay, so um, uh, uh, just a sort of overview of the talk uh, altogether. First, the motivation, why I talk about Marx's theory of absolute rent. Uh, then a discussion of the three kinds of rent, where uh, let's say I think absolute rent is the trickiest of the three kinds. So, so I'll go through the three kinds as a way of sort of building up to absolute rent. Uh, and then I had been planning to discuss uh, the interaction of rent theory with value theory, but actually it took me 45 minutes just to get through rent theory. So uh, maybe I'm doing too slowly. You can tell me what you think. Um, I gave a talk on value theory in Quark. Uh, so, you know, if you're interested, uh, you can look at my YouTube channel. Um, but we can maybe talk about how value theory and rent theory relate in the, in the question and answer period. So, in terms of <clears throat> the motivation, uh, when uh, Professor uh, Wong invited me, I thought, well, he's an economist, and I've been thinking about uh, economics, so it would be a good opportunity to, you know, um, learn from him and uh, have his ideas. He unfortunately can't make it tonight, uh, but he's, I think, here online. Uh, and then also, uh, I have, you know, moved to uh, Dublin about... Uh, six months ago, and I found that the rent here is extremely high. So I have been thinking, why is, you know, what is it that decides the level of rent in an economy? Why is Dublin, why is the rent so high? Yeah. And then uh, last, so now we know, you know, why I'm thinking about a theory of rent, and then maybe why Karl Marx as my theorist. Well, I was the director of a Confucius Institute, and I'm speaking at a Confucius Institute. So I thought, you know, we should keep it within the, the family of uh, Marxist, Leninist uh, thought, yeah. So, um, so now turning to uh, the three kinds of rent. The three kinds of rent are monopoly rent, differential rent, and absolute rent. So I will just head straight in talking about uh, monopoly rent. So the question with monopoly rent is basically something along the lines of why is Chateau Lafitte Rothschild so expensive? Yeah. And um, throughout the presentation, I'm going to contextualize Marxist theory within the sort of greats of classical political economy. So uh, in this case, monopoly rent, monopoly rent in Adam Smith, monopoly rent in David Ricardo, monopoly rent in Karl Marx, and then uh, to sum up, why does monopoly rent exist? And what is it that determines the level of monopoly rent? So first, monopoly rent in Adam Smith. And I'll, I'll read these. I know it's kind of bad practice in PowerPoint, but uh, there you go. Uh, so Adam Smith says, it sometimes happens, indeed, that the quantity of land which can be fitted for some particular produce is too small to supply the effectual demand. The surplus part of the price, which remains after defraying the whole expense of improvement and cultivation, may commonly, in this case, and in this case only, bear no regular proportion to the like surplus in corn or pasture, uh, but may exceed it in almost any degree. And the greater part of the excess naturally goes to the rent of the landlord. So that's him explaining uh, monopoly rent uh, in principle. And then here's a discussion of wine as a concrete example of monopoly. So he says, the vine is most affected by the differences of soils than any other fruit tree. From some, it derives a flavor which no culture or management can equal, it is supposed, upon any other. The whole quantity of such wines that is brought to market falls short of the effectual demand or the demand of those who would be willing to pay according to the rate at which they are paid in common vineyards. The whole quantity, therefore, can be disposed of to those who are willing to pay more, which necessarily raises the price above that of common wine. The difference is greater or less according as the fashionableness and scarcity of the wine render the competition of the buyers more or less eager. Whatever it be, the greater part of it goes to the rent of the landlord. So uh, turning to David Ricardo, David Ricardo doesn't very explicitly have a, uh, a theory of uh, monopoly rent, but he does discuss monopoly prices, and then he, he includes wine in among those. So he says, 
There are some commodities, the value of which is determined by their scarcity alone. No labor can increase the quantity of such goods, and therefore their value cannot be lowered by an increased supply. Some rare statues and pictures, scarce books and coins, wines of particular quality, which can be only, sorry, which can be made only from grapes grown on a particular soil, of which there is a very limited quantity, are all of this description. So, you know, he includes wine among those things that command a monopoly price. Uh, and then, uh, we, we, you know, we have to work it out for ourselves, maybe that that, uh, that would mean you would get a monopoly rent as well. Okay. So now uh, moving on to our friend Karl Marx, he says, uh, when we refer to a monopoly price, we mean in general, a price determined only by the purchaser's eagerness to buy and ability to pay. A vineyard producing wine of very extraordinary quality, which can be produced only in relatively small quantities, yields a monopoly price. The wine grower would realize a considerable surplus profit from this monopoly price, whose excess over the value of the product would be wholly determined by the means and fondness of discriminating wine drinker. This surplus profit, which accrues from a monopoly price, is converted into rent and in this form falls into the lap of the landlord, thanks to his title to this piece of the globe endowed with singular properties. Here then, the monopoly price creates the rent. Okay, I'll just point out that it's clear that uh, that uh, Marx was more of a, a wine aficionado than Adam Smith was, yeah? Because Adam Smith, you know, says maybe these wines aren't so great, but Marx has no problem with it, yeah. Okay, um, so why does monopoly rent exist? Because bits of the globe with sui generis productive properties in terms of their use values, like being able to make really nice wine, are privately owned. And why does, uh, what, what, what sets the level of monopoly rent? Well, the answer there is the consumer's willingness and ability to pay for the commodities uniquely produced on the relevant lands. So uh, I think you'll agree that monopoly rent is not conceptually very difficult, but it's, I think it's a, it's a nice way uh, to, to, to warm us up, yeah? So now I want to differential rent. This time, and I'll explain why in a moment, I'm going to start with David Ricardo, then move backwards to Adam Smith, then uh, go forwards to Karl Marx, and then explain why does differential rent exist and what sets the level of differential rent. So differential rent is, um, is at the core of Ricardo's principles of political economy and taxation is really Ricardo's big idea, uh, but there are, there are some hints of it in uh, Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations. So I, I think it's just kind of much tidier to, to start with a clear presentation uh, of the theory and then find the hints of it in Smith than, than, than the other way around. Okay, so here's Ricardo on differential rent. When in the progress of society, land of the second degree of fertility is taken into cultivation, rent immediately commences on the first quality and the amount of that rent will depend on the difference in the quality of these two portions of land. When land of the third quality is taken into cultivation, rent immediately commences on the second, and it is regulated as before by the difference in their productive powers. At the same time, the rent of the first quality will rise, for that must always be above the rent of the second by the difference between the produce which they yield with a given quantity of capital and labor. Now I'll just summarize that for you. We're imagining that in a country there's, there's, um, there's different kinds of land and some of them are better and some of them are worse. Well, if there's a, if there's a certain demand for corn, for example, that requires that you use inferior land, then let's say that inferior land has no rent it's determining the price because without it, you wouldn't be getting enough of the product. Uh, and then if I own really good land, that means I'm, I'm basically able to produce 
uh, for cheaper, even though uh, I'm getting the same high price. So that difference, because uh, let's say, maybe we can imagine it in the first instance, it goes to the farmer. Uh, but when he goes to renew his lease, the land will, will say, ah, it seems like you got a lot of money there. Maybe you can pay more for this nice land I'm renting. So that's differential rent. Um, and now we see, uh, is it? Yes, okay, sorry, yeah. So now uh, back to Adam Smith, yeah. So um, he doesn't distinct, he, you know, uh, Smith never says, oh, now I'm talking about this kind of rent, now I'm talking about this kind of rent. It's sort of all mixed together, but we can kind of pull these things apart. So uh, he says, rent, it is to be observed, therefore, enters into the composition of the price of commodities in a different way from wages and profits. Higher low wages and profits are the causes of higher low price. Higher low rent is its effect, is, or is, is the effect of it. So uh, that, let, let just observe that he's speaking very generally, but is, it, it, it has to mean what Ricardo was talking about, that the price is determined by the poor quality land. And then if you can produce cheaply because you have good land, you can charge a high rent. On the, for, for that land. So, so uh, the price is setting what the rent is. It's not the other way around. And then he gives one example of coal mines where he, he talks about it in this way. And the point of this quote is that on uh, coal mines that need to be mined in order to, to meet the effective demand, uh, no rent is charged. So he says, some coal mines, cannot be wrought on account of their barrenness. The products do not pay the expense. They can afford neither profit nor rent. There are some on which, uh, is this up there? Yeah, okay. Uh, there are some on which the produce is barely sufficient to pay the labor and replace together with its ordinary profits, the stock employed in working them. They afford some rent to the undertaker of the work, but no rent to the landlord. They can be wrought advantageously by nobody but the landlord. So the idea there is at the margin, the, the, you know, the marginally productive uh, land has no rent. Okay, so now we turn to uh, differential rent in Marx. And I think this is a very clear uh, description. So I'm going to, uh, it, so it's a little long, but I, I decided it's worth, it's worth doing. So he says, uh, let us assume that most of the factories of a certain country derive their power from steam engines, while a smaller number derive it from natural waterfalls. The surplus profit of the producers who use a natural waterfall as motive power is to begin with the same, uh, in the same class with all other surplus profit. Maybe I'll just mention, why, is, why, is, why are you getting surplus profit if, if you have a waterfall? It's because you don't have to pay for the coal to heat the steam, right? This surplus profit then is likewise equal to the difference between the individual price of production of these favored producers and the general social price uh, of production regulating the market in this entire production, product, production sphere. To what circumstances does the industrial capitalist in the present case owe his surplus profit? It arises from the greater natural productiveness of labor bound up with the application of a force of nature, but not a force of nature that is at the command of all capital in the same sphere of production as, for example, the elasticity of steam. Because you know, steam is also just a natural you know, uh, component of the, of the world, yes. On the contrary, it is a monopolizable force of nature, which like the waterfall, is only at the command of those who have at their disposal particular per portions of the earth and its appurtenances. Now let us assume that the waterfall, along with the land to which they belong, are held by individuals who are regarded as owners of these portions of the earth, i.e. who are landlords. Under these circumstances, the surplus profit is transformed into ground rent. That is, it falls into possession of the owner of a waterfall. It is evident that this rent is always a differential rent, for it does not enter as a determining factor into the general production price of commodities, 
but rather it is based on it. It invariably arises from the difference between the individual production prices of a particular capital having command over the monopolized natural force on the one hand, and the general production price of the total capital invested in the sphere of production concern on the other. It is due to the greater relative fruitfulness of specific separate capitals invested in a certain productive uh, production sphere as compared with investments of capital which are excluded from these exceptional uh, and natural conditions favoring productiveness. So that's uh, Marx on differential rent. So I've presented, um, let's say, for both monopoly rent and differential rent, our three classical political economists as if they have basically the same uh, ideas. And I think for monopoly rent, that's true. Uh, but uh, is it true for differential rent? I think it's not true. Um, but uh, but uh, this talk, uh, yeah, and I'll just say there's a very nice paper by uh, Ben Fine uh, from uh, 1979, where he discusses, he contrasts the theory of differential rent in Karl Marx and the theory of differential rent in, um, in Ricardo. Uh, but uh, I'm not giving a talk tonight about differential rent, so I'm not going to go into these details. Uh, instead, I'm going to uh, press ahead, yeah? But uh, just to finish up with... Uh, uh, differential rent. Why does differential rent exist? Because bits of the globe with greater or lesser productive properties are privately owned, and those with the, the lesser productive properties are the ones that regulate the price. In other words, because in agriculture, the generally reproducible circumstances of production tend to be among the most expensive, not among the cheapest, as is, the, as, as is typically the case uh, in industry. Like in industry, if I have a really uh, great new technique, you know, that can that can lower my uh, price of production, well, that's uh, then then bully for me. But you know, either I have to patent it or I have to keep it secret. At some point, it leaks out and other people start using it. But that doesn't happen with land. You own land. You can keep people from using it by just by just by owning it. Okay, and then what sets the um, what sets the level of differential rent? Well, it's the difference between the individual and the social price of production of the produce of a particular piece of land. Yeah, if I have good land, I can charge higher rent. Yeah. Okay, so that's it for differential rent. So we've done we've done monopoly rent and we've done differential rent, and now you know what you've all been waiting for: absolute rent. Okay, so now uh, you know you've gotten used to the routine. We're going to have absolute rent in Adam Smith, absolute rent in David Ricardo, absolute rent in Karl Marx. Then why does absolute rent exist? And what sets the level of absolute rent? And you're, you're all wondering, what, what is this absolute rent we're, we're talking about? Well, here I pulled out, uh, you know, once again, Smith doesn't distinguish these things. He sort of mixes them all up. He's, he's quite, I mean, he's quite a clear writer, but he, but he He's 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 always talking at the level uh, of the concrete, basically, and you have to sort of abstract to the theory yourself. Okay, so here's what he says: As soon as the land of any country has all become private property, the landlords, like other men, love to reap where they never sowed, and demand a rent, uh, even for its natural produce, the wood of the forest, the grass of the field, and all the natural fruits of the earth which when land was in common, cost the laborer only the trouble of gathering them, come even to him to have an additional price fixed upon them. He must then pay for the license to gather them and must give up to the landlord a portion of what his labor either collects or produces. So this is, um, this is a, 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 let's say, I think, think of it as a fee to access land in principle. It doesn't have to do with the, you know, this is special land that makes, uh, you know, particularly good wine or is more, more productive than the neighboring field for, for wheat. It's just in order to access land, you have to buy off landlords as a class. Okay, and then um, here is another uh, relevant passage from Adam Smith. He says, rent considered as the price paid for the use of land is naturally the highest 
which the tenant can afford to pay in the actual circumstances of the land. Yeah, landlords are not in the business of, of, of charity, right? The rent of, uh, of the land, therefore, considered as the price paid for the use of the land is naturally a monopoly price. Now you're confused because Smith is saying that rent is a mon you know that rent in general is a monopoly price, whereas earlier I had distinguished you know monopoly is just one kind of of rent. So actually, one one thing I, I would like to explore is what's the relationship between absolute rent and monopoly rent? As you'll see, Karl Marx also uses the term monopoly in relationship to absolute rent. Okay, so. Moving on to David Ricardo, uh, things are quite easy because Ricardo just doesn't believe in absolute rent. He, he explicitly, let, well, let's say he, he explicitly denies it, except that the term wasn't around yet. It's Karl Marx who actually terminologically distinguishes these three quite clearly. Uh, but Ricardo doesn't believe in, in absolute rent. So uh, I just want to have one caveat there that I'm not going to go into, uh, but there's one passage where Ricardo quotes Smith discussing how the price of barley land regulates the price of corn land. And, and it, it's possible to understand this as a kind of um, implicit uh, endorsement of some kind of theory of absolute rent. And this is discussed very nicely in this article by Buchanan from 1929. But once again, I'm, I'm going to just sort of leave that to one side and say, well, he says he doesn't believe in absolute rent. So we're gonna take his, uh, take his word for it. And, uh, and here is a passage from Ricardo. So Ricardo says, uh, as, as I've already kind of mentioned before, that there, there will be no rent on the least fertile cultivated land. So he says, on the first settling of a country in which there is an abundance of rich and fertile land, a very small proportion of which is required to be cultivated for the support of the ac actual population, or indeed can be cultivated with the capital which the population could command, there will be no rent. For no one would pay for the use of land when there was an abundant quantity not yet appropriated, and therefore at the disposal of whosoever might choose to cultivate it. On the common principles of supply and demand, no rent could be paid for such land for the reason stated why nothing is given for the use of air and water or for any other of the gifts of nature which exist in boundless quantity. Now, uh, Marx is not very impressed with this article, this, uh, this um, argument. Uh, and he says in Capital Volume 3 about uh, Ricardo, he says, it is highly absurd to speak of free bourgeois colonies where in agriculture, neither the capitalist mode of production exists nor the form of landed property corresponding to it, which in fact does not exist at all. Ricardo, for example, does so in his chapter on ground rent. In the preface, he states that he intends to investigate the effect of the appropriation of land upon the value of the products of the soil. And directly thereafter, he takes the colonies as an illustration whereby he assumes that land exists in a relatively elementary form, that its exploitation is not limited by the monopoly of landed property. So he's saying this is a, you know, he, he basically says, I'm going to explain something, and, he, and then he assumes it's, um, it's not an issue. Uh, and then in another passage, Ricardo uh, sort of says that, well, and even if there were such a thing as absolute rent, it wouldn't matter. So this is what he says. But suppose there were no land which did not afford a rent, then the amount of rent on the worst land would be in proportion to the excess of the value of the produce over the expenditure of capital and the ordinary profits of stock. The same principle would govern the rent of land of a somewhat better quality or more favorably situated and therefore uh, the rent of this land would exceed the rent of that inferior to it by the superior advantages which it possessed. The same might be said of that of the third quality and so on to the very best. So he's saying here that like, okay, so maybe the worst land does have some rent on it, but then all lands will have that amount of rent. So conceptually, uh, absolute rent and differential rent are, are orthogonal to each other. They have no relationship. So in order to explain rent, you know, theoretically, it suffices to 
assume that the worst land has no rent. Now, uh, again, uh, Marx, this time in theories of surplus value, says Ricardo solves the difficulty by assuming that in principle it is non existent. Okay, so now uh, I will move to Marx's theory of absolute rent, but in order to do that, I have to take a little excursus, just a tiny one, into price theory. So uh, there are three kinds of price in, in Marx, uh, labor values, prices of production, and market prices. So labor values are how much uh, labor is socially necessary to create a, uh, a commodity in, in the given circumstances of the economy. And then, and then that explains relative price sort of in very broad brushstrokes uh, where something that costs more labor to produce is going to command a, a higher price. This is you know, the labor theory of value. Uh, and in order to have labor values make sense theoretically, you have to have an economy in which there's relatively free market in, in commodities. Uh, so no price fixing, if you like and a relatively free market in labor. Now, if you add in a, a relatively free market in, in capital investment, then you move from labor values to prices of production. And a price of production is all of the cost that the capitalist experiences in, in producing something, plus uh, the, the prevailing level of profit in society. And you can think of that as the price that the capitalist is aiming for. Uh, so, so, so it's the cost price. So that's just the cost to the capitalist, including wages, materials, depreciation of fixed capital, and then um, and then the uh, the profit on top of that. And the idea is, if a capitalist doesn't get this on their capital, then they will withdraw capital from that sector. That will reduce the supply, and that will up the price. Uh, and then those capitalists who are remaining will get this price of production. Uh, and then similarly, if, if there's a really great uh, profit rate in a certain sector, that will attract capital investments, which will increase the supply, lower the price. So, uh, so and this is what uh, Ricardo and, and Smith call the natural price. Now, of course, in the actual price that an individual pays on a particular occasion is determined by short-term uh, conditions of supply and demand. And in, in Marx's theory, each of these... Uh, three, or let's say they come in this order uh, where, where labor value sort of determines everything else in the sense that labor values, the question is, how does the society allocate uh, labor time in different sectors to the production of different commodities? And then uh, that is sort of transformed, is the word we use, into prices of production, through uh, capitalist competition. And then those prices of production sort of manifest in the marketplace as, uh, as market prices. So, so this is just basically a question of definitions and this is value theory. So, so you know, I'm not going to defend it or explain it in any more detail. You just have to sort of know the, this, these are what these terms mean. And then uh, we will see how he uses them to explain absolute rent. Okay, so uh, Marx says, the fact that the tenant farmer could realize the usual profit on his capital, did he not have to pay any rent, is by no means a basis for the landlord to lend him land gratis, uh, sorry, to lend his land gratis to the farmer and to become so philanthropic as to grant credit gratuit for the sake of a business friendship. Uh, such an assumption would mean the abstraction of landed property, the elimination of land ownership. And it is precisely the existence of the latter that constitutes a limitation to the investment of capital and the free expansion of capital in the land. Or must the market price rise to the point where even the worst soil, A, yields a rent? That, that's a rhetorical question. He's saying, yeah, it, you, the market price has to rise high enough to, to get even the worst uh, land rented. In other words, does the landlord's monopoly hinder the investment of capital, which would not be the case for the purely capitalist from the purely capitalist standpoint in the absence of this monopoly? Okay. 
Thus, assuming the demand requires the new lands to be taken under cultivation, whose soil, let us say, is less fertile than that hitherto cultivated, will the landlord lease it for nothing just because the market price of the product of the land has risen sufficiently to return to the farmer the price of production and thereby the usual profit on his investment in this land? By no means. The investment of capital must yield him rent. He does not lease his land until he can be paid lease money for it. Therefore, the market price must rise to a point above the price of production so that rent can be paid to the landlord. Since, according to our assumption, landed property does not yield anything until it is leased, is economically valueless until then, a small rise in the, price, in the market price above the price of production suffices to bring the new land of porous quality uh, on the market. Now, I want to emphasize this where he's saying it, it can be a very small amount, absolute rent, but the landlord needs something or he's not gonna let you have his land. Now, then you might say, okay, he's splitting hairs because when Ricardo says there's no, there's no rent on the, on the worst land, he doesn't really mean no rent. He just means you know, a, a, a theoretically insignificant amount of rent. So maybe this is hair splitting on Marx's part. Uh, the question then really becomes what sets the level of absolute rent once we uh, admit that it's a theoretical possibility. And I will get to that in a moment. Uh, but first, I think it's useful to see how Marx distinguishes absolute from differential rent and absolute rent from uh, monopoly rent. So here he is uh, distinguishing differential and absolute rent. So differential rent has the peculiarity that landed property here merely intersects the surplus profit, which would otherwise flow into the pocket of the farmer. Uh, the, the farmer is as opposed to the landlord, right? Landed property is here merely the cause for transform, uh, transferring a portion of the commodity price, which arises without the property having anything to do with it, and which resolves itself into surplus profit. The cause for transferring this portion of the price from one person to another, from the capitalist to the landlord. But, th but landed property is not the cause which creates this portion of the price, or the rise in price upon which this portion of the price is premised. So differential rent doesn't change market prices. Whereas, on the other hand, if the worst soil A cannot be cultivated, although its cultivation would yield the price of production until it produces something in excess of the price of production, rent, the landed property, then landed property is the creative cause of the rise in price. Landed property itself has created rent. So that's the major you know, conceptual difference that he draws between differential and absolute rent. And now, uh, how does he distinguish monopoly rent uh, from absolute rent in particular? Because we've seen he actually uses the word monopoly when describing absolute rent. Okay, he says, does it follow from the fact that the worst soil yields ground rent, that the price of the product of the land is necessarily a monopoly price in the usual sense? This by no means necessarily follows. And the contention that it does has been made only because the distinction between the value of commodities and their price of production has heretofore not been understood. Just in passing, a lot of commentators in the Marxist economics literature see absolute rent as a kind of monopoly rent. And you know, here Marx is saying, if you think that, it's because you haven't understood the difference between uh, price of production and, uh, and value. And it's, it, th that, this passage doesn't seem to have been much discussed uh, by those people who see absolute rent as a form of, uh, of monopoly rent. Anyhow, uh, the fact that products of the land are sold above their price of production does not at all prove that they are sold above their value. It is possible for agricultural products to be sold above their price of production and below their value. The rent uh, would create a monopoly price if grain were sold not merely above its price of production, but above its value. So there you have a clear uh, distinction. Absolute rent is uh, when something is sold above its price of production, but below its value, and it becomes monopoly rent when it's uh, when when the rent uh, re requires that the price go above the value of the product. Okay, so uh, just to 
to, to sum up the differences between the different kinds of rent, we have first monopoly rent is caused by private monopoly over particular pieces of land. It raises the price of particular highly differentiated luxury commodities. You, know, you, you get things like fancy wine and it raises prices above labor values. It raises market prices above labor values. Absolute rent is caused by a class monopoly over land per se. It doesn't have to do with individual landlords owning individual vineyards. It has to do with the institution of land ownership as such. It raises the price of generic basic commodities, and it raises market prices above price of production, but not above labor values. And then just to you know, complete the picture, what about differential rent? Well, differential rate rent doesn't affect prices at all. Okay. So when I first read all of this in uh, theories of surplus value, this line in the sand between uh, absolute rent and differential rent seemed quite arbitrary to me. And I'm not alone in that. So uh, Bortkiewicz says in 1919, Marx claims that in a state in which all spheres of production are subject to competition and accordingly the industrial products are sold at their prices of production, uh, the agricultural products will be sold at a price under certain conditions concerning the organic composition of capital, which is above their price of production, but not above their value. But why should landed property, if it has the power to oppose the laws of capitalist price formation, be bounded by the limit of value? And so what's so special about this particular amount? So I want to discuss that a little bit, drawing the line between absolute rent and monopoly rent. Well, both monopoly rent and absolute rent are the results of a balance of class power between capitalists and rentiers. Um, and I will admit uh, that in part, it's a conceptual difference. Like, you, you know, if, if we think of it from the subjectivity of the participants, you know, uh, you can't tell whether you're paying a, an absolute rent or a monopoly rent. No bell goes off when market prices raise above values. But I will argue that the social circumstances in which they happen are different. So a sector-wide monopoly in order to raise uh, things above value would require conscious class solidarity, which is perfectly possible. For example, the corn laws, where, where, where the landlord class just said, we're arbitrarily going to keep uh, uh, prices high. Uh, but absolute rent requires only unconscious class solidarity, right? So what I mean by that is, is, is absolute rent requires that landlords think of themselves as landlords, and they think of their, their property as you know, something they can expect money for. Whereas monopoly rent, um, if, if it were to affect basic commodities, would actually require, uh, you know, cartels, some kind of class-wide conspiracy. Okay, so why does uh, absolute rent exist? It exists because bits of the globe, irrespective of their productive powers, are privately owned. And now, last, but it's a little complicated. What sets the level of absolute rent? And I'm going to argue that it's opportunity cost. This is not something that, uh, well, and I, I'm, I'm going to argue that Marx thinks it's opportunity cost, although this is not something he makes very clear. Okay, so um, the first thing to say is that Buchanan in his 1929 ar article argues that this is Smith's view. It's also not very clear in Smith, um, but he argues that Smith thinks absolute rent is set by opportunity cost. And, and e even more clearly, John Stuart Mill, he, he thinks, thinks this. And, uh, and I'm going to argue that it's, uh, that it's Marx's view. Uh, and I'll just mention passing that Buchanan weirdly just is, seems totally unaware of the existence of uh, Karl Marx or the term absolute rent. Uh, so he sees himself as, for the first time, distinguishing in 1929 uh, these sort of two traditions of thought about rent in um, in uh, classical political economy. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, 
So just a, you know, classic Aristotelian syllogism, if Smith thinks opportunity cost uh, determines the level of absolute rent and Marx agrees with Smith, then Marx also thinks opportunity cost uh, is what determines uh, the level of absolute rent. And uh, in order to show this sort of philologically, if you like, I'm going to go through both authors' discussion of the rent of corn land versus the rent of coal mines. And then I also think there's a positive argument to make that Marx thinks it's uh, opportunity cost that sets uh, the level of absolute rent, absolute rent. And that is that uh, he has this nice discussion about sheep walks being turned into deer parks. So turning first to the rent of corn land and the rent of coal mines, Smith proposes that mines have only differential rent, whereas corn land has both absolute and differential rent. And uh, Ricardo, you know, you won't be surprised to hear at this point, disagrees, saying that the case of mines also holds for agricultural land. And then Marx agrees with Smith. And then uh, Marx and Smith don't say so explicitly, but uh, I think it's clear that why is it that corn has absolute rent and mines don't? It's because there are more opportunities, there, there are more alternative uses available for corn land than for mines. The only thing a coal mine is, is used for is mine coal, right? So here's um, Smith on the rent of mines. You've seen this quote before, so I won't, uh, I won't uh, read it out, uh, but it's, it's this argument that there are some coal mines that don't uh, attract any rent. And what Ricardo says about this is, the whole principle of rent is here admirably and perspic perspicaciously explained, but every word is applicable to land as it is to mines. Yet he, that is Smith, affirms that, quote, it is otherwise in a state's above ground. Okay, and then here's uh, what Marx says, and, and I, I, well, it was quite hard to kind of know where to start this quote, so, so forgive me for that, but he says, but in all of this, Adam Smith does not offer any explanation for absolute rent. Which he, which he presupposes to exist for land that produces food. He is correct when he observes that it does not necessarily exist for other lands, mines, for instance. So you see that, you know, and, and that's as much as there's evidence for, and I'm just appealing to you, what is their intuition about the difference, Smith and Marx, that, that corn land gets absolute rent and mines don't. I think it's that that corn land you could use for other things. You could use for sheep pasture. You could use for building houses, whereas uh, coal mines you can only use as coal mines. Okay, now the discussion of sheep walks being turned into deer parks. So in, um, in theories of surplus value, Marx draws attention to a passage uh, in, in Smith that I would like to call uh, the progress of commodification. This is describing how uh, as, as capitalism hangs around, more and more aspects of nature and of, of human life are subject to commodification. And it's, I'm just going to read it as if Marx wrote it, but the stuff in quotes is from Addison, right? So, in every farm, the offals of the barn and stable will maintain a certain number of poultry. These, as they are fed with what would otherwise be lost, are a mere save all. And as they cost the farmer scarce anything, so he can af afford to sell them for very little. While this supply is sufficient, poultry is as cheap as butcher's meat. With the growth of wealth, the demand grows, and consequently, the price of poultry rises above that of butcher's meat until it becomes profitable to cultivate land for the sake of feeding them, that's poultry. As cattle are among the, the first, so perhaps venison is among the last parts of this sort of rude produce, which will bring this price. So if you like, this is like almost a sort of economic indicator for Adam Smith. You have, you know, you have this, this strict order of things that are subject to commodification. First corn, then butcher's meat, then poultry, then hogs. And, and in his own day, he sort of foresaw that one day venison will come under capitalist cultivation. Uh, so this is what uh, Marx says. According to Adam Smith, the gradual rise in the price of these raw products only proves that, little by little, they are becoming products of human industry. While previously, they were practically only products of nature. 
their transformation from products of nature into products of industry is itself the result of the advance of cultivation, which is increasingly limiting the scope of the spontaneous production of nature. I, I think you see a little bit of Marx, the environmentalist here, but I would also just point out that I think uh, a, a lot of the economic development that we've seen in, in, in the meantime, since Karl Marx time, fits this pattern. You know, so recently we've seen friendship and romance commodified. Yeah, so you start with you start with land, then you do uh, uh, you, know, you get to poultry at some point, you venison, and then you know at some point love is also commodified. And, you know, we'll all find out in the next uh, few decades uh, what uh, things entrepreneurs decide uh, that they can commodify. Uh, but the point is, it, it, it's not very explicit in either discussion. There's some kind of opportunity cost going on there, right? That's, that there's land and you're deciding, do I leave it fallow? Do I use it for agriculture or do I grow uh, poultry on it? Now, I'll just point out that uh, by the time we get to Karl Marx's uh, life, the venison stage of capitalist development had already been reached. So uh, in Capital Volume 1, this is a section, the famous section on primitive accumulation. Uh, after discussing the dramatic example of the Duchess of Sunderland evicting 15,000 of her clansmen tenants to create pasturage from, for 131,000 sheep, Marx quotes Summers as follows. And I'll just tell you, this is an amazing passage in this book uh, that includes you know, this, this, this woman uh, there's, there's, you know, she, she, she has all these tenants that, that, that have been, you know, she's the, she's from the chieftain, uh, she's from the, yeah, from the clan's chief family, and then at some point the relationship of, of chieftains to uh, members of the clan is sort of reinterpreted as landlord versus tenants, and she just kicks everyone off the land, and, um, and even sets fire to a hut that has an old woman in it, so it's a, it's a very dramatic uh, passage. Uh, but uh, we don't want to get distracted by it, even though I, I have. Um, here's what Summer says. Sheep were introduced into glens, which had been the seats of communities of small farmers, and the latter were driven to seek subsistence on coarser and more sterile tracts of soil. Now deer are supplanting sheep, and these are once more dispossessing the small tenants, who will necessarily be driven down upon still coarser land into more grinding penury. For it is a fact that a mountain range laid out in forest is in many cases more profitable to the proprietor than when let as a sheep walk. So what I want to emphasize, so this is Summers talking, but it's quoted by Marx and Capital. And the point is the landlords are constantly thinking, do I get more money by running to farmers? or do, renting my land as pasturage to sheep or for deer parks so that people can come and, and hunt for fun, yeah? So there is this, um, you know, just to kind of return to my argument, this is evidence that Marx thinks opportunity cost is what's setting the level of absolute rent. And then just one passage where he explicitly talks about the choice faced by landlords uh, to, to uh, make their land available to industrial versus agricultural production, he says, and this is in the discussion of absolute rent, he says, the mere legal ownership of land does not create any ground rent for the owner, but it does indeed give him the power to withdraw his land from exploitation until economic conditions permits him to utilize it in such a manner as to yield him a surplus, be it used for, agri for actual agriculture or other production purposes such as buildings, et cetera. So there he's saying, you know, it's opportunity cost that determines the level of, of absolute rent. And that is going to be my conclusion, uh, which is that absolute rent is set by the highest differential rent that the land could possibly command if allocated to another use. So if you like, um, if I have the worst corn land, it's maybe not the worst sheep land. So the differential rent, the kind of potential differential rent that I would get by allocating it to sheep is what sets the, the floor for you know, rent in corn uh, across the sector. So that's my argument as to uh, you know, we, 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 well, let's just say now trip down memory road. You now we covered monopoly uh, rent in the three classical uh, economists. 
Then differential rent, uh, skipping over the differences between uh, Ricardo and Marx. Then we covered uh, absolute rent, which is very murkily presented in Smith, is explicitly denied by Ricardo, uh, is, is clearly elaborated by Marx, but maybe not as clearly as one would have liked. In particular, uh, it's clear that absolute rent exists because of the, 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 the existence of land ownership as an institution, but he doesn't say very much about what sets the level of absolute rent. And I'm arguing that it's, uh, it's the uh, differential rent of other possible allocations that sets the level of absolute rent. Uh, and so that's uh, the whole talk. And I'd like uh, to thank you for uh, your patience in listening to it. Uh, we want to thank Professor Hill for this wonderful talk, and we'd be happy to take comments and questions. We have roughly 10 minutes, so maybe someone from the audience or someone who's following online, let's see. Yes. Um, so this is all like in terms of production and manufacturing, but I guess more in the consumer market, the kind of rent that we'd be paying, not as farmers, not as uh, factory owners or whatever, I don't really understand how this connects to sort of like the reason that, I don't know, rents uh, in South Dublin is so high, you know, because we're not using that land to cultivate corn, we're not mining land, we're not building a factory in there. So is it more just sort of social clout that determines it? Um, so there's, so um, Smith has a, has a discussion of, of house rent, uh, and Marx doesn't as far as I know. Uh, but I think it's clear that this is the theory that's available to us. And then the question is, how do we apply that to, to house rent? And I think that, uh, it's, that it's clear how that, or yeah, it, parts of that are clear to me and parts of it aren't. So absolute rent, totally clear. Basically, absolute rent, uh, the existence of absolute rent, or, or, if, or if you like, um, no, let me put it this way. The institution of landed property explains both absolute rent and the institution of homelessness. Uh, because, you know, we have loads of empty apartments and we also have homeless people. Why don't we just let the homeless people live in the empty apartments? It's because someone owns those apartments and they would rather keep them empty than have homeless people in them, right? And uh, so I, that is absolute rent. That's, that's the, the work that absolute rent is doing for us. Now, the question is, why are some flats more expensive than others? And there, personally... Uh, I have trouble distinguishing, I, I think that the difference between um, monopoly rent and differential rent is not as clear for house rent than it is for agriculture, where um, let's say you have uh, an amazing view from your apartment. I think it's pretty clear that um, if, if, if that's a kind of unreproducible view, uh, then the extra amount you pay for that view is monopoly rent. But to the extent that, you know, other people can build uh, apartments in the same, uh, you know, neighborhoods with kind of analogous views, then it would be correct to see that as differential. So, um, so that's how I would make a first pass at applying um, uh, this theory to, to house rent. There has been some work done on it in um, in Marxian economics, and I, I'm not terribly familiar with that literature. That's sort of where I'm going to go next, among other things. Uh, but I'll just mention, you know, in terms of public policy recommendations, right? Because economics, economics is always about public policy recommendations. Uh, if you want to fall short of something like worldwide proletarian revolution, um, both no, I would actually say all three uh, theorists agree that differential rent is an excellent thing to tax because it doesn't affect price, right? If, if, you, if you introduce a tax that affects absolute rent, then it's not the landlords who will pay it. They'll just pass it on to their tenants. But if you can somehow design policy to, to attack differential rent, then that is a tax that, that, will, that will A, not raise prices, and B, not alter the behavior of anyone in the economy. So, so even if you're some kind of right-wing Austrian, you should be fine with, with high tax on differential rent. Yeah. Uh, hi, Professor Hill, and thank you for your presentation. It's very interesting. So uh, Karl Marx is uh, kind of one of my favorite uh, philosophers, sociologists, but 
uh, I assume a theory of brand is kind of the least known theory for a lot of people. So like it's very, it's very famous for its complex theory or theory of alienation. But his role as a economics uh, is more inspired, it seems like, than Adam Smith. So his work is more focused on the highly division of labor in modern societies. And it's more focused on, as you just talked about, uh, uh, productive labor in agricultural. Uh, but my query is that it seems most of Marx's theories have, have been proved to, to fail, like to, to explain the social changes in the past decades, especially after the 1990s. So uh, uh, what I'm interested in is that for the theory of brand, it seems very hard to apply the theories which focus on the productive power of the land to the urban brand, I mean, like, like the like the uh, a gentleman just said, like we don't call it corns or uh, you know like the farming in, in our uh, urban cities. But however, I think they can. Is there any like symbolic values attached to the to the land nowadays? Like so, let's say like for the red cross in the North Dublin, South Dublin. I would you all know that the, the North part is less expensive than the southern part because the north part is more perceived as like the race occupy with uh, lower social classes they are more dangerous whereas like, the southern part is more safer right like, if you have a place like around like ucd that's the embassy area it's it's more like prestige so it's a kind of a symbol of your social clubs so it seems like the people paying for their rent or property is no longer determined by the absolute values that's just say like okay there's great sceneries here or it's a uh, very convenient amenities or it's very good complex but rather it seems that the symbolic values attached to the to the physical property so i'd like to hear your views on that yeah, so there's, I, I'm going to actually distinguish there being three uh, things in your sort of comment question. One is um, sort of like Marx, like, like let's say what kind of intellectual was Marx, if you like, that's one question is like, uh, you know, theory of rent, theory of alienation, theory of value. Uh, one has to do with sort of the, the subsequent trajectory of uh, political economy. Uh, and then one has to do with what determines uh, rent in, 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 a, in a modern economy or in, in a contemporary economy. So on the first one, I'll just, I'll just point out, I mean, I think there's, there, it is the case that, let's say, in terms of the institutionalization of Marxism, uh, at least in the West, uh, that it, uh, it's been just kind of barely hanging on as a thread in, in economics, uh, and then has had a very big impact in uh, Literary studies and in certain in certain um, in, in Marxist humanism, uh, and that happened. Well I, well, I don't want to go into you know a, a lot of detail about that. As information is also available elsewhere, but I just want to point out that uh, that work comes from uh, books like um, the uh, the German ideology and the theses on Feuerbach and. The kind of earlier works, and that Marx's own, you know, trajectory was, you know, he did his PhD in philosophy, and then Engels introduced him to economics, and then he saw uh, his work in political economy as his important work. Yeah. So, and and in fact, you know, Engels and Marx thought that the German ideology was so important that they 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 when they tried to publish it and no one wanted to publish it, they said, okay, fine, we won't publish it. Um, and, and years later, they said, ah, this was something we did when we were kids, it doesn't matter. So I think, you know, that's something that's important to me, is that let's say, if, if you're interested in Marx as an intellectual, one question you might ans ask yourself is, you know, what is the relationship uh, between things like um, the Communist Manifesto and um, the German ideology, the sort of early stuff, and uh, capital, you know, volumes one, two, three, and four, if you like, which is what theories of surplus value is. It's the intended 
uh, capital volume four. So that's on the first point. On the second point, I think that there's at least, let's say, I, I was able to see a lot of lectures kind of coincidental to the rise of neoliberalism in the sort of early 80s and whatnot, uh, where people try to set up a perspective of sort of right to left, where, where, uh, where Smith is on the right, Keynes is in the middle, and Marx is on the left, something like that. And I think that is just a grotesque uh, misuse of intellectual history. And uh, I will just point out that, that uh, so, so, some facts from, from Smith. So, so Smith says tax the landlords. <laughs> he, says, uh, he says the interests of society coincide with those of workers and landlords, but never trust a capitalist. Uh, he, he also says that the institution of private property is there to protect the rich from the poor. So, <laughs> you know, I, I don't like, 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 I, I just don't think people are reading the book. You know, <laughs> I, I think basically the, the, the throwaway comment about the invisible hand and the thing about the, the benevolence of the butcher and the baker is just the only thing that people read from, from the book. So, so, you know, I, I want to really push against this idea of, uh, of Adam Smith as, as a right winger. And I'll also just mention, because I lived in, in the UK for 10 years, he opposed colonialism. He thought slavery was immoral. And, um, and it's, it, you, you, it's not very clear, but it's clear to me that he was uh, a Republican. Because, because he, it, when he's talking about uh, taxation, he, he, he basically has this comment where he says, um, uh, chief magistrates, by which he means like presidents and kings, are the same, except kings are more expensive because they wear fans are clothes. So, so he he clearly also opposed the monarchy as an institution. So I think he's pretty left wing, even by today's standards in in the UK. Um, so that's on the second point, and on the third one, I just want to point out this is not special about rent. Also, now you know you buy a Gucci handbag, it's not any better as a handbag than any other handbag. Uh, but you pay more because it says Gucci. So there is this sense that that uh, dialectical materialism as a sort of approach to understanding the world is very bad at this kind of spectacle and prestige stuff. I don't think there's any reason to think that. And I actually think that this is handled very well by monopoly rent, uh, even in Adam Smith's comment, where he says real or imagined, where like the the in in, in the Marxist jargon, a commodity has, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, a commodity is, has two faces, right? The use value and the exchange value. And uh, the exchange value is determined by the socially necessary labor time, uh, but the use value is, is socially determined. So there's, there is no problem with like the use value of this handbag is having a handbag that says Gucci on it. And then the question is, but the labor theory of value would tell you it would, it would cost just the same. Well, if commodities traded at their values, but they don't because of competition between capitalists, that's the, that's the transformation from, from, uh, from uh, labor values to uh, prices of production that happens in volume three. So I would understand, and this is actually, I kind of, sorry, I'm getting you know, excited, but this, this is actually where I think uh, rent theory has some real work to do uh, for value theory, where you can understand, uh, let's say, Gucci as uh, that trademark is they have created a monopolizable use value. And that monopolizable use value allows uh, the charging of a monopoly price. So I think that, that the, the, the apparatus is totally there to handle uh, a contemporary economy. And I would actually say, uh, when you look at something like high tech companies, um, intellectual property rights, a big deal nowadays, you know, we're worried about the Chinese uh, stealing all our intellectual property. Well, in intellectual property is just something that's made up as an institution in order to uh, command monopoly prices on things. Like it's, it's a way of keeping prices above the price of production. And it's bad for, for development, right? So I think you know, capitalists shouldn't like 
intellectual property right, let alone socialists. Um, but anyhow, that's my attempt to, to sort, of, sort of use uh, Marxist rent theory to apply to some of these kind of more, let's call them I idealist use values that are, are typical of, of contemporary capitalism. And I think, you know, that the fact that the economy is getting less and less real in some sense is that trajectory that Smith traces. You know, we've, we've already commodified the venison. You know, now we need to look for <laughs> these more sort of <laughs> mystical things like uh, prestige, yeah. I think, yeah, yeah, one last question, and after we are out, out of time, please. I have a question, like, if land and hence housing is treated as a commodity, do you think the right of housing can be achieved in Dalton City? So I didn't, I, I understood the if, but not the then. So if, like, land and hence houses are treated as commodity, do you think the right of housing could be achieved in the urban cities? In urban cities? Okay. Um, this, like, can, can they get the right of housing? Well, uh, they could under socialism. Uh, <laughs> uh, otherwise, I do think that, like I said before, that, that, that if you want to keep uh, under capitalism, you, if, you, if you designed a tax to, uh, to fall on differential rent, that would give you money that you could use, you know, I don't know, to subsidize uh, housing for, for you know, for you know, for any social purpose, yeah. Well, let's thank Professor Hill once again, and thank you all for coming.